Hoffa day, everyone, and welcome back to The Hub. I'm Nestor Leconto, and joining me for today's show is uh, former Governor Eddie Calvo. It's great to be back. <laughs> and, and a senior advisor to the Lou and Josh campaign, uh, former colleague uh, Ginger Cruz. Thanks for joining us again, Ginger. Thank you. Honored to be here. All right. So first, I wanted to go uh, over some of the numbers. I know mm -hmm. it's been three weeks since the uh, primary election, but the uh, Election Commission th just this week uh, made it official. Um, so um, I want to see what you guys thought about the numbers. I know it's uh, Felix and Tony and didn't run directly against uh, the governor and, and, and Josh. But uh, uh, let me see uh, if we can pull up that screen. Yeah. All right, this is the results. Uh, Lou and Josh, 12,224. Uh, Mike and Bree, 7,309. And as I said, uh, Felix and Tony ran separately on the Republican side, 3,008. And I know the camps have probably had an opportunity to, to go through the numbers, to parse through it village by village. And I know it's not uh, a, a direct contest, but uh, let me start with you, Gab. What do you think of those results? If you add up, you know, people, you you do the math, the basic yeah. math, and and well, even if, if even if he uh, Felix got all of Mike yeah. and Bree's numbers, you know, wouldn't meet. And it's amazing. I was talking. First of all, it's, yeah. it's great to be with, like I said, the you know the original newscasters. <laughs> the OG. I, uh, I think my dad was probably still in politics when he first started. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you know, it's part. And I'm going back to history. It's par for the course. And I know I was talking to some new Republican candidates, and they're freaking out. I said, folks. Every primary I've known, when it comes to the Republican Party and the Democratic Party going back decades, when you see the numbers, uh, this is what is basically, you know, par for the course. Uh, yeah, the Democrats always seem to have more candidates, both in the gubernatorial side and now congressional and the legislative side. And there is just a much more bigger turnout in primary. I guess Democrats are... The, the core are much more, I would say, excited, mm -hmm. but you, you see this large variance in, um, in the numbers when it comes to a primary. Usually, on average, and I said back decades, it, it's between 10 to 15 percent of the votes uh, in a primary are Republican and the rest are Democrat. And I think this, this year we're about 14 percent, so we're in that, in that area. So... Usually what happens, general election, there's much more excitement. You start seeing the independents uh, and, uh, and, and I, I guess better turnout with Republicans and Democrats. And um, what usually happens, things balance out. And that's where, you know, we've had Republic, more Republican governors than Democratic governors. We've had a bunch of Republican majorities and super majorities. But it always starts out in a primary where, especially if you're a new candidate, you're like, oh my goodness, us Republicans are, are in trouble. So I'm not, I'm not worried about it. But I am, there is a concern I had, and I brought this up in an earlier interview. The percentages between the Democrats and the Republicans, that's not no shock. What I am concerned, and especially from your folks, your, you folks' days, uh, again, covering politics from the beginning, it's the percentage of voter turnout right. you know, over right. the, for the past few years. And I, I'm, I'm concerned not for the Republican Party, not for the Democratic Party, but for um, the, the elective process in Guam. I'm, I'm concerned that you know, we, we may start having uh, a, a large percent of the electorate that does not get involved in the process. So that's something, yeah. and I'm hopeful that with our candidates in the Republican Party and what they generate, the same within the Democrat side uh, and in the nonpartisan elections, that there could be a, a, a more excitement and a higher voter turnout. Well, we did have a near record uh, 58,000 registered voters, but mm -hmm. only 40% showed up for the primary. But mm -hmm. uh, Ginger, I know you're a, a numbers gal, and what do you make of uh, what the breakdown is? I know, uh, as I said earlier, it's not a direct uh, battle yet uh, coming, it will be on November 8th, but yeah. what, what, are, what are, have you guys uh, talked about in terms of uh, what the numbers uh, show? So a couple of observations. Uh, the first observation was um, that the Camacho team got less votes than Tenorio did in the last gubernatorial race where there was an uncontested Republican race. So even though there was lower, lower turnout, which you know could also account for that, it was a smaller number. So that like literally is the smallest number of any Republican gubernatorial team in any primary uh, by far even in an uncontested race. So something that, that we noticed. The other thing that, that we have done is we've sort of gone back through all of the years and looked historically at the numbers. 
And we've sort of looked at the historic numbers for Felix Camacho, because he's been a known quantity for 30 years. And we've been looking at the numbers for Lulian Guerrero, who has been a known candidate for 30 years. And one of the trends that I found really interesting was the sort of slow erosion in the number of voters that voted for Felix Camacho. Now, it's a little bit apples to oranges, I get that. I mean, the last race that he lost, he was running for Congress. Um, and then before that, he was the two-term governor. So, and then before that, the legislature. So it's hard to do an exact comparison because these are different races. But if you just sort of in general look at the numbers of voters who see his name and vote for him, that has steadily gone down with no anomalies. If you look at Lilian Guerrero, it's sort of gone up and down over those years. And she's never lost an election, you know, aside from the one where she was running as lieutenant governor. But then again, uh, you know, that was also the same case for Felix Camacho. So if you just look at all the races in which she has run, she has a voter base that knows her. Um, she's been a name in politics for 30 years. And her support has remained steady and, in fact, strengthened um, year over year in, in many cases. So. That, to me, was something when we looked at these primary numbers and we sort of looked at all the primary numbers going back 30 years that I found pretty interesting. Yeah. Historically, Gov, one of the things that we've kind of seen is that um, when a Republican wins, it's because there's a lot of Democratic uh, crossover votes. Mm -hmm. uh, is uh, the MSN camp uh, going to uh, be a factor? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll get to that. But first, just to add on to, to the flavor of what I saw in this primary, number one, the highest voter turnouts were in the south, in the southern part of the island. The southern part has always been a stronghold for the Democratic Party. If you see the areas where there was, again, less voter participation, uh, both in places like Tumuning uh, and uh, Mungtotumaiti uh, and places uh, such as even Dedido. I did very well, you know, in my last election, Dedido very, very well, and Jigo. So, you know, that's, I, I go back to, you, you also have to look at these numbers and say, hey, we gotta, we gotta get these areas where traditional strong Republican votes, get them up. As for Mike Sinicholas, you're asking me, um, you know, for a fellow, you know, first of all, you know, I, I look at it this way. Uh, I, I look at how much was put in, in terms of, you know, the, the inherent, strength of an incumbent in, in a lot of non-political ads that seem very political coming from the Leon Guerrero administration, all these programs, um, plus her advertising. I saw a fellow like Mike with very little advertising, very little signage, mostly social media. And yet, you know, he got nearly you know, close to 40% of, of, of that vote in the 30s, but still, you know, he got 7,000 votes. Um, so it was substantial based on what what we saw uh, in, in, as evidence in television commercials and signage uh, and the type of, uh, of purchase media. So, you know, for what, what I look at is that, um, number one, if you, if you look at, I mean, we've had four years of an incumbent. You look at that constituency that voted for Mike, mostly Democrats, you know, they're looking for change. So I have a strong, you know, again, it, you know, I, I do believe how Governor Felix and, and Tony Atta reached out uh, to Mike uh, and his supporters. I think it bodes well in terms of getting a, a fairly large percentage uh, of the Mike Sinicholas supporters. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, m moving towards uh, getting, a, get a, getting a better uh, voter turnout in the general election and getting those numbers up uh, in areas that are traditionally strong areas of Republican independence, such as Tumuning, Dedido, and Jigo. Looking at the numbers, Jinja, who has the more difficult um, path to ad loop? It would seem like um, Felix and, 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 and Tony. Uh, yeah, but let me just go back to the Mike Sinicholas mm -hmm. uh, issue, because I mm -hmm. think that was some important points that you made there. Uh, one of the calculus that also needs to sort of be factored in there is, in the primary, was that a pro-Mike Sinicholas vote, or was that an anti incumbent vote. As we know with any incumbent re-election, I mean, as was the case with Governor Camacho and as is the case with Governor Lulian Guerrero and Josh Norio, there is a certain component which just is angry, they're dissatisfied, right. and so there's an anti-vote. And once the primary is over, you know, 
there really was no machine. There was no grand ground game. There was no like Mike Sinicholas establishment that goes with him like Carl Gutierrez and like Robert Underwood. So in his case, now that you're looking at the general, there's two candidates and people will need to make a choice. And you've got two people who have histories who were both incumbents. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be a very different calculus when it comes to that, you know. And then the other thing is, what about the establishment Republicans? I was going to ask mm -hmm. you, Governor. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you know, way, way back in the day, I worked for, for former Congressman Ben Blas, mm -hmm. highly respected in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And that embrace from Felix Camacho, calling Mike Sinicholas the best congressman that we've ever had, and the stickers of Mike Sinicholas going up on these Camacho ad assigns, mm -hmm. are there establishment Republicans that are like, hey, wait a minute, you know, wh what about our ideals? What about the Republican Party? And why this strong embrace of somebody that's outside of our party? You know, first of all, they, Mike and, and Governor Felix have an interesting relationship, both personal-wise, too. True. There, there's familial ties, True. and Guam is family. So though he's a Democrat, and though Governor Felix is a Republican, there is those familial ties, and, and they're tight. Um, and that's one component. I think if you look at history, and I, I recall uh, in my first election, um, you know, when, when I beat Mike Cruz in a very spirited uh, primary, I saw a bunch of uh, 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 Mike Cruz stickers uh, and Carl Gutierrez stickers intertwined. As a matter of fact, uh, the Mike Cruz headquarters uh, turned into the Carl Gutierrez headquarters. And, and that's just how Guam is in a small island like this. There's alignments and realignments. And it ultimately comes to the point where those, and you just mentioned uh, about those that are opposed to the status quo, there, there is a desire and the cream rises to the top and the, and the curd falls. And, you know, heck, um, though things like that are happening now, they've happened in the past, uh, but in the end, it's those folks and whether they were Mike supporters or they didn't vote or they're independents, they decided that they, they, they believe that maybe the best interest for the people of Guam is a change. And again, with me, that, that happened with me as well in, in, in my election. It's happened in the past as well. You're, you're a, you're a, you know, you work with Governor Carl Gutierrez. It's interesting with Governor Carl Gutierrez, a whole bunch of people that were supporters, my dad and Tommy Tanaka, uh, you know, they were strong Republicans, but they became Carl Gutierrez supporters. Uh, you know, then eventually Democrats. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it, it, you know, you, when, you, when you look at, like you're saying, what's happened here about the establishment Republicans and, well, it's the establishment Democrats and the establishment Republicans. Um, this is history. There's nothing bizarre about what happened with Mike and Felix, aside from even closer familial relationships than what's happened in the past, and whether myself, or Felix Camacho, or Carl Gutierrez, or Governor Joad, or Governor Ricky Perdalio, or my father. All right, we're gonna take a quick break, but I wanna get back to that question about the road to Adeloupe uh, right after this mm -hmm. break. Right. Please stay with us. All right, we are back, and let me get back to that qu question, Ginger. Um, so who, based on what you've seen so far and what your analysis has been, has the more difficult road to Adeloupe? Well, I mean, so the incumbency, as we've looked, I mean, historically, the incumbency really is difficult to, to overcome. Um, and I think really one of the overriding points of the past performance, I mean, the, the good thing for voters is you have two past performances, right? I mean, you've mm -hmm. got a record under Governor Camacho. You've got a record under uh, Governor Lulian Guerrero and, and Josh Tenorio. And I think one of the big things that people just have to sort of look back at is their performance during COVID. I mean, this is unprecedented, right? This is 600 million people have COVID around the world. 6.5 million have died. I mean, this isn't just like, oh, a typhoon or something that happened. This shut down the world. And the fact that Guam is coming back as quickly as it has, sometimes in our little bubble, we don't appreciate how difficult that is and how, how much effort goes into doing that. And, and I think that people are going to judge that. I think the fact that we were blessed with having a nurse with a, a master's in public health who happened to be governor at the time that the worst pandemic ever struck the island was really something that I think in their hearts people will judge. A lot of the economic conditions that continue to plague the island, that, have, that plagued Governor Calvo, that have plagued every governor, 
um, are, are things that can be addressed, but this pandemic was something that was a once in a lifetime event. And I believe people will judge her performance on trying to do the best, trying to save lives, understanding that it was having a negative impact on businesses and trying to get that money out to businesses and to people as much as she could. I think that really is what it comes down to. And, and I think Camacho's record, I mean, he had the worst record on tourism, frankly, the worst record on finance. His unemployment was through the roof. His, the homeless number was twice as bad. So, I mean, if you really start to look at the records, which I think we're gonna see more of, I mean, the, the choice is clear in addition to the fact that the incumbency is a really impossible thing to overcome. It's interesting that it's an interesting coincidence that both of them came into office with the, the governor came in, of course, with a pandemic. Uh, and then when uh, Governor Camacho came in, it was the series of typhoons that, that struck mm. at the beginning of, of his term. So what do you think, uh, well, Governor, what do, you, what do you think is the, who has a more difficult path to they, Obviously, the, the, what, what uh, Ginger mentioned on the incumbency and the par of the incumbency in terms of presenting your face uh, or your programs, because I, again, uh, Governor Lou has a big war chest uh, with uh, with uh, in terms of her her campaign. But then again, have you seen again unprecedented the the, the amounts of monies that have been spent on public service uh, announcements by her administration on all the different programs? Uh, you know, it's there's a lot of Lulian Guerrero everywhere. So you know, at its face, you, you look at that, there's more exposure. And then I go back to what Ginger said about you look at history and you, you, you look at the history and you look at what the, uh, the candidate has to office, uh, offer. And anyone who's looked at what uh, Governor Felix has presented in his platform, very, very focused, uh, touching so many areas, at the same time focusing on, hey, you the people, I believe in you, uh, whether it's on, on what you do with your families, what you do with your business, what you do with your homes, I'm going to empower you. But then looking back at history, and that's an interesting uh, issue on, on, on Governor Felix. You're right, you know, Governor Liu had this pandemic. But with Governor Felix, you go back to 2002 and you see the situation uh, on the island totally devastated uh, from, from the typhoon. You know, he couldn't even stay in Adelope. Even government house was shut down. And you look what, what, what it meant to the economy. Uh, Governor Liu is bragging about you know, getting out of this deficit. You know, by the way, the first year of her deficit, that was a budget that I worked with, with the, I mean, with her surplus, was myself and the legislature working on, on 2019. And that surplus that we had for that year cut the deficit to 40 million. So cut it in half. But, but I, I digress. With Governor Felix, we look at, even my time, we had almost a billion dollars general fund. Governor Liu, over a billion. Governor Felix's uh, first year, aside from devastation of Guam, we had a general fund of about $328 million. And the deficit he inherited was about 225. Now, if you, you look at that percentage of a deficit towards the total revenue coming to the government, if you were to juxtapose it to the current situation with, with an administration that it's at about a billion dollars, that would be akin to if that same situation that Governor Liu was confronting would, would not be a deficit of 80 going to 40 million, uh, it would be a close to $700 million deficit. So Governor Felix came in with an island that was totally devastated and a deficit of $700 million, I mean, I mean 200 uh, million, but again, like with Governor Liu, that would equate to like 700 million, but was able to rebuild the island, build a whole bunch of schools, police stations, and of course, pass the baton to me where we took it to another level. So I, I think when you look at Governor Felix, what he did, what he plans to do, there's a lot of, a lot of good things to, uh, uh, to talk about and compare. And then of course, you know, I haven't gotten to the part about, you know, Governor Leon Guerrero's um, uh, record, but for two years, she shut this island down. Inflation has gone up. The only thing that's gone down is the price of crystal meth. It's gone, I think in my time, from five to $600 a gram to now it's a little and bit over 50 thing, yeah. and 75. <laughs> and you know, mer the homicide rate has, uh, has doubled. Uh, even some of the issues on, on, on the statistics are coming out with crime and violence. 
uh, once I'm glad they finally made an arrest of someone bringing drugs into the, to the, the DOC. But if you look at my record on, on our drug arrest, yeah, we were having an arrest every week at Department of Corrections of people trying to bring drugs in. Now, because there's very, very few arrests of folks bringing drugs into DOC, does that mean it's not happening? No, it's mean it's not being interdicted. And I go back to the sexual assaults that have occurred in, in, in our island in the past four years. What I'm concerned about is particularly child sex molestation. The most of the child sex molestation cases and how they were brought to the, to the, to, to the police was because a, a child was going to school and he reports it to a teacher, to a friend, and then that gets reported. We had two years yeah. of no school. But, so I'm just wondering a little bit some of the issues on, on, on that are unreported. Yeah, let me get uh, to Ginger to respond real sure. quick to some of those points, and then we'll move mm -hmm. on to the to the debate. I want to talk about that. Do you mm -hmm. have anything to say? Sure. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, sure. Let me unpack a lot. <laughs> so the, uh, just, I mean, there's a ton of points when it comes to how did Camacho deal with those issues during his time. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the data points, I mean, during the eight years that he was in there, they had ARRA funds, which are similar to the ARP funds, federal funds. He left 65% of those unspent on the table, and you had to go get $150 million of it back. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that wasn't a great you know, performance. When you're talking about the platform, I've read the Camacho platform cover to cover, and I'll tell you, it's disturbing. There's no solutions that are presented, like on the economy, like a clear plan for how to increase revenue. There's nothing there. When it comes to the issue of crime, the platform talks about things that are within the purview of the courts and the attorney general's office, which has nothing to do with the governor's office. And we all know that Governor Camacho had an edifice complex because he thought, you know, building five police stations was the solution when, in fact, in your transition report, when you took over from eight years of Camacho, you noted that they had a five-year plan to increase staffing and they'd only gotten 27% of it done. And you said that was a terrible performance. Now, I'm not trying to say that, you know, it isn't still something that needs to be addressed and the governor's tried to address that, but that's been a longstanding problem. And the governor now has done more to interdict drugs at the post office and so many other places and absolutely try and do things to deal with the root cause of the crime, not just build a, a pretty building, but to actually deal with drug treatment, drug rehab, um, and putting more police on the streets and interdicting more of the supply that's coming in. Crime is a huge problem, and, and they're very serious about it, and they are doing things about it. Uh, another interesting thing from the platform, okay, real quickly, the Camacho another, team break. <laughs> wants to put contractors into the villages and put guns in their hands, and, and that's their solution to crime, which frankly would be people that are not under the purview of the police department, but then again, maybe that's a good thing, because we all know that under Camacho, the morale under the police department was bottomed out, and they you know they were running a prostitution ring that was and you know had police officers that were involved. So, a lot of questions, a lot to unpack. I really hope people do take a serious look at the two records. All right, the edifice complex. That's new enough. <laughs> we're gonna take a short break and be back with even more. Please stay with us. All right, we are back, and uh, let me ask you guys, about, it's been about uh, a little over a week since uh, the debate. Um, what is uh, your uh, reaction to that? Uh, has, has there been any impacts that, the, that you've uh, seen, Governor? Well, I, there has been no polls taken on the Republican side that I know of, but I'm not too sure on the gubernatorial side, but I thought Felix did very well. Uh, you know, he, he was composed, not emotional. Uh, he was factual, um, you know, um, I, th I think with, with the governor, he, he was forceful. Um, and that's a good thing. I think when you, when you, when you see, and I, and I, and I, when I, I got to just go back to when Governor Camacho first came to see me and, tell, and told me that he's going to be running and why he was running. Obviously, the, the gentleman uh, you know, has been out of politics for a few years, eight years in office. I'm not too sure you know, why he wanted to jump in. But he just, he saw what was going on in the community, wanted to get involved, did a lot of prayer. Um, and and, and you know, because of that, he was willing to, to take that, that step. And, you know, who would blame him? Uh, you know, when you see what has happened, and I, I, I go back to, to, the, to the, 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 what, it, what is happening to our island, particularly in crime. One of the first things Governor Liu did was was to, was to end the Mandania Drug Task Force, and you know that was uh, again led by Ray Tenori, the lieutenant governor, 
but you partnered all the local uh, public safety institutions and the federal uh, uh, public safety institutions uh, and worked and collaborated on, on, on interdiction and arrest of, 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 of criminals, particularly we know in Guam that most of the crime has, has a nexus towards drugs. So, you know, the, the, um, the, it was working. We, we, were, we, we had four uh, uh, drug-sniffing dogs. Poor dogs were all busy uh, because they were sniffing out drugs. But, you know, they, there, was, there, there, was the, there, there was some progress being made. And again, now we, we have, you know, four years later, it's unfortunate when you see the criminal activity, it's tied to drugs. When you're seeing the homicide, it's tied to drugs. When you see the homelessness, it's tied to drugs. And I agree with, with, with you, Ginger, but uh, that it's, that's one side of it. But there are other areas that we were working on in our Republican administration. Remember, I was just talking to a woman from uh, in, 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 in construction, one of the ladies that owns a construction company. She worked with my wife uh, in setting up a program in the prison uh, for getting these, and these were all these, these ten, they were, I think the first graduation class was 10 women. Mm -hmm. It was all tied to drugs. They were in prison, but they got the skills training for heavy equipment operations. I was there at the graduation ceremony and all these ladies graduated when, and when they got out, they all had a job. So, you know, we, we, we've got to look at it comprehensively, but I, I do believe what, what's happened in the past four years, you had an administration the first year, maybe with getting their feet wet, but they weren't moving on a lot of things other than hiring. And then, then the COVID hit and they shut, the, they shut things down. Um, and now they're trying to catch up. I got a hand, I, was, I thought I was gonna be here with Governor Carl Gutierrez. I saw early on and I, you know, God bless him because I know Governor Carl Gutierrez. I like the except that we have to run against each other, you know, we had our debates, but what a great guy. And he's got energy. I don't know how an 80 year old man has that energy, but I could tell some of the comments he was making in the newspaper and in the interviews, it sure was his hint of waiting saying, Governor Lou, can you unleash me? And can you get me to get the tourists back? So, you know, yeah. that's my, my, my two cents worth. Yeah, let, let me go to Jen. So <laughs> did the debate move the needle any either way? Um, I think the debate, so one of the things that struck me, especially as a woman, were just the nasty comments. I mean, calling her a tyrant, saying, take the scales off your eyes. I literally had like a handmaid's tale flashback as I was sitting in the audience. I mean, I thought that was extreme. Um, and, and even the governor afterwards said, that isn't the Felix Camacho I know. I mean, that was extreme for him. So that was sort of a, one of those shocking moments. And he didn't just say it once, he said it twice. And, and so, I mean, it just, it was disturbing. But the other thing that really kind of got me at the essence of it is his accusations about her being a tyrant and being authoritarian all sort of trace back to the fact that during the first initial days of COVID, when we didn't know how deadly this was going to be, we didn't know if we were going to exceed GMH capacity and have people dying because they couldn't get a bed. And when she took the measures to try and prevent that from happening, that's what prompted him to call her a tyrant. But if you look at the way he would have addressed it, what gets me about the Camacho team is that they put money over the lives of the vulnerable, which to me is not a very pro-life stance and it's not a very pro-Christian st stance. He says, how dare you take away our freedoms and make us wear a mask? Really, that's more important than wearing a mask and protecting the life of the Manamku or protecting the life of someone who's recovering from cancer or protecting the life of somebody with a breathing problem or somebody with diabetes? Like you don't care about their life because you want everybody to have the freedom to wear a mask. And if Governor Leon Guerrero says, no, you have to wear a mask to save people's lives, you call her a tyrant. I just thought it was so discordant because his whole raison d'etre, the whole reason he's running for governor is because he has this strong Christian belief and he's pro-life. And I thought those are two things which the governor is pro-life. She cares about everybody's life. Right. And to attack her for that, I thought was just really hypocritical. All right, we got to take uh, one more quick break and we will be back with uh, to finish up the show right after this. Please stay with us. Stay on top of breaking news and the biggest stories of the day with NBC News Daily. Get in-depth reporting from across the country and around the world. Tips to take care of your health and your wallet and up to the minute local news. NBC News Daily weekdays on NBC. 
All right, we are back. Uh, with, they got about five minutes left, but I wanted to get to. We were talking off camera again about what the, one of the keys to uh, the general election is going to be voter turnout. And as I said earlier, we don't, in the primary there's only 40 percent voter turnout, which disappointed a lot of people and surprised a lot of people. Governor, um, what's the key? How do how do we get the voters out? And who and who didn't show up? Well, me and Ginger were just talking about that earlier. You know, some of the analysis uh, we've looked at. And again, she mentioned something about the age demographic. And it leads you to believe, you know, certain age groups, just didn't show, like you mentioned, the young, certain villages, um, you know, if, if, if the north, particularly Daddy Doe area, if there's a very low turnout, then there's certain demographic groups and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we have a strong Filipino population here, but if most of the south voted and, you know, a bigger chunk and less of the north, that means that, you know, obviously, maybe less Filipinos voted in the election, uh, uh, Filipino Guamanians, uh, and that demographic. Um, so you, you gotta look at those numbers. And by the way, it, to me, it just like, it, it, it's, it's not good. It's not, you know, I'm seeing in the United States where voter turnout, you know, we used to be the opposite. Um, America always had the 40% voter turnout. Yeah. We were the 80 percent, yeah. you know, from my dad's time and Ricky Berdali's time and, and Governor Carl's time. Yeah. We were the 80 percent voter turnout. And now things are flipping because in the United States, it's going up and in Guam, it's going down. I think what we need, the messages from from our candidates in the Republican side, the same as um, with the Democrat side, they got to see how, how an election, you know, how it affects their lives. And, you know, like I said, for the Republican side, we're going to look at, hey, Look at your situation right now. Uh, look at your situation. It was two or four years ago. You know, where are you at now? And you know, you know, can can we make things better for you? And this is how we're going to do it. The same with the Democrats. They're going to look at another way of doing. It. You know, they're going to say, "Look at us now," and we're better than we were four years ago. So I think we've got to entice the people in terms of, "Hey, this is good for you, the people, to get involved in this elected process." And I think there's enough differences and contrasts. And I, I got to tell you, there's one thing. It's not just in Guam. It's it's you know obviously the Democratic Party has been in control here, but uh, also in the United States with the Biden administration and Congress, it's also been one. It's been a uniparty control of the territory and the federal government uh, for these past few years. And you know, looking at the results of issues, um, I, I don't know how much time I have, but I'm, I'm, maybe I better cut very, it. But very little. I, you I, I see the get impacts now, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of it has to do again with one party. Yeah, change real quickly. Uh, what's going to drive turnout? Um, well, manga kabai bayan, you've got to come out and vote. I mean, we've got to get the Filipinos out. I mean, I think that's really important. When you look at Dededo, that really is the stronghold. Young people really need to come out and vote. I think they're not seeing in the candidates somebody that they can relate to. I think age is one of those issues. That's why you're seeing the older voters come out. Younger voters have to get more engaged, and I think part of that is just reaching out to them and, and having campaigns that they can understand and they can relate to. And that's something that the Democrats are going to try very hard to do uh, this campaign season. I'm sure everybody is going to be trying to do that because young people need to come out and vote. They used to be the majority right. 30 years ago, and now the young people are the minority. So we've got to get the young out. We've got to get – it's everybody's island, and we're all so directly affected by what happens. And especially for women, I think it's really important because there's so many critical issues facing women now. Um, of course, women's reproductive rights being among them. So I would hope that everyone understands the people who they elect are going to determine what happens for the next two to four years. And I hope they all come out. As always, I wish we had more time, but we're out of it. So uh, thank you both for, for joining us. Uh, Governor Eddie Calvo thank and uh, Ginger Cruz, uh, thanks for joining us. Good, good got, chat. Good. Very nice. I'm Nestle Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you again next week on The Hub. <laughs>